He's never going to let us go. So, uh, matter of fact, uh, children, you're staying here today. It's the fifth Sunday, so don't don't run away. It's fifth Sunday, we're staying here. Uh -oh. We're giving out things for the children. Uh, so, if you would, just be seated back with some adults. It would be great. And so, if you don't have any of those things, just Candace made out some things to give you that you can kind of be doing as you're listening, and we know that you're young, you can do both. Uh, some of us older ones can't do that. And so today, we're going to be in God's Word. I title of the sermon today, Double Miles, Please. Now you may think, well, what world is that about? Well, I'm just saying just to get you to think mainly, but we're living in a day today when people get credit cards because they're mileage cards, and if they get double miles, they buy the stuff that they're putting out there for you to get double miles on, so that someday after you spend about twenty or thirty thousand dollars, you might get a free plane ride. Let me tell you, it's not free. You pay for it. Matter of fact, I'll tell you this: all those credit cards have got higher interest than other credit cards. So you're, you're going to pay unless you pay it off every month, and if you pay it off every month, praise the Lord that you're able to do that and give God the glory. Uh, but also, there's all kinds of deals out there that people have. You know what we always like? We like to get guarantees, don't we? Matter of fact, don't we like to get lifetime guarantees? I don't know about you, but I, I'm that way. Matter of fact, 20-some years ago, we had a car, and uh, Deb, Deb and I had this car, and this is the time that back then, Sears was given lifetime warranties on parts and labors on everything that they did on your car. And so, I mean, we took this car and it got everything fixed. I mean, we got new brakes. They even had lifetime warranty on tires, which is really dumb. As long as you own the car. We did brakes. We did uh, water pumps. They did belts. We did an alternator on the car. We did other things. Now, most of these were going bad. We just didn't change it because they had a lifetime warranty. But, because we drive junk. And so, but we knew that lifetime warranty if we kept that car long enough, it would pay for itself. Man, I got some, when we take that car back in there, they just shake their heads. Because they had to replace it for free. And so, as we would do that, and I, at one time I figured it out, but with the money we had, they had done five to six times that much work on it by the time somebody stole that car and we quit driving it. I don't know how long we'd have drove it if they wouldn't have stole it and messed it up. And it went to auction, but uh, I was wanting to see how much we could get out of Sears. You know, I wanted to make sure their lifetime warranty was true. And the guy said, as long as you got that paperwork when you bring it in. I kind of wonder if they didn't send somebody to steal the car. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but don't we look at things like double miles and getting things for nothing? And, and if you buy... <laughs> There's local stores here. If you buy five packs of things, it costs you this much. You got to be careful on that. Add up what those little boogers cost you. All right. I, I had a friend that worked in IGA in the meat department in Alaska, in Kenai, Alaska, and he, and he would. I'd go back and see one because he, he sold our church all the leftover. They freeze it before it would go bad, and they put it out, and they sell it to our church for a buck a pound. And so we bought hundreds and hundreds of pounds of meat every month from him. And I go back and back and talk, but he goes, watch the cameras there. He goes, because they'd always buy one and get one free. He said, those people don't have enough sense to realize that if they buy one that costs $30, to buy another one that costs $30. So they'll buy one, but you got to pay for the highest price for them. They'll buy one for $30, you get another one for $15. He said, we just made a lot of money on that person. And he was laughing about it because they weren't smart enough to stand there and add up to make sure and pick up things the same size. Now here's the thing, folks. I believe we're sharper shoppers sometimes than we are getting the blessings that God has for us. All right. So what I, what I want to say is, is that very simply God's word is plain that he will bless us. But there's certain things you have to do. You see, if that old car we had that we kept taking to Sears, 
If I never took it into Sears, they can never fix it for free. Yeah. If you and I never take it to Jesus, Come on. he can never take care of it All right. for free. Yeah. All right, you see, as we go through life, we keep going through life many times the way we've always been through life. And I'm going to tell you, that's not the way to do it. So we're going to look at several verses today. And I'll try to preach fast, but I'm not guaranteeing anything. Okay, we're in Matthew 6, starting with verse 1. It says, Watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. You see, if you and I are doing something so other people see it, you just lost that reward. You got it from that person. When you and I do something that nobody knows about, that's when God can bless what's been done. We go on to verse 2, and it says, When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. That's pretty powerful. Amen. We got to watch it. Oh, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. As a matter of fact, I believe that you and I should take out I, me, my, my out of our vocabularies because they all show ownership and we have no ownership. We have servanthood to Jesus Christ. Amen. We go on. In verse 3 it says, But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, you may say, well, how dumb is it? I can't do anything without my right hand knowing what my left hand is doing. What it means is very simple as this. If you do it, forget about it, and get on. It says, give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Give it in private. Don't talk about it. It's not for everybody else. It's to glorify God. And I don't know about you, but I want double honors. I want to be glorified by God. I want God to look down and bless me. I don't really care about people blessing me. I want Almighty God to bless me. It goes on in verse 5 and says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Wait, you mean I can't even go out there and pray? No, not when it's about you. You mean I can't go out there and pray for people? Not when it's about you. You can pray for people all you want when you make sure that's about Almighty God and you're only there to do it because of God. Excuse me, I wish I could pray like some people pray. I really do. Some people could just pray to you. I'm not a beautiful prayer. I, I'm just like everything else. I just get down to it, ask God for work, and get on. You know, I mean, I talk to God when I'm in my car. I know, I've said this before, that people think I'm crazy when they go by because I'm talking. They probably think I'm singing. I don't play music in my car. I'm just talking to God. And sometimes it gets a little exciting when I talk to God. Because sometimes, you know, it's kind of like preaching. I don't know when I do it, but sometimes it just happens to get louder when I do it. And so when I talk to God, that's the way it is. And so I want to tell you, though, God tells us that we shouldn't be out there bringing attention to ourselves. We should only bring attention to God. And you say, well, Pastor, doesn't that mean if we get out there and pray in front of the people? No, it means you're a hypocrite because you're not doing it the way God told you to. We go on now in verse 6 and it says, When you pray... Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Amen. You see, God, we're telling you, now listen, we do have corporate prayer, don't get me wrong. We do pray in, in meetings, and we do ask people to pray, that's good. But I want to tell you, your real, real prayer life starts when it's you and God alone. Amen. And if you don't have one, you need one. Amen. We're going to go on down to verse 16 through 18. 
And verse 16 says, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. Well, they try to look miserable. <laughs> Can you believe this? And this shovel of so people have, have to admire them or will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that's the only reward they will ever get. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people looking like, oh my, oh, it's going so bad. Or they go to a dinner and they say, oh, I can't eat right now. What's the matter? You sick? Oh, no, it's not that I'm sick. I'm, I've been fasting for the glory of God. Get off of it. You just got your reward. Quit fasting. There's no sense in it. <laughs> Verse, I'm sorry to be so bold, but you all know that's just the way I am. Verse 17 says, But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. And some of you, that may be bringing attention to yourself. I'm not sure, but you're supposed to be doing whatever you normally do, all right? Don't bring attention to yourself. In verse 18 it says, Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. You want to get rewards? Do it God's way. You want to see things happen in your own life? Do it God's way. You want to see things change in your walk? Do it God's way. We're going to go on now. To 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 23. And some of you say, oh Lord, 23 more verses. Don't worry, we're going to go pretty quick. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would a spiritual person. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world and as though you were infants in the Christian life. I don't know about you, but if I came up here and as bold as I am, I said, you're just all a bunch of babies. That's what he's saying. Paul's saying, I couldn't talk to you well on you because you were spirits and weren't there. You're a bunch of babies. But he, he doesn't stop there. He just keeps on going. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. I'd give you the bottle. Guess what? You're still sucking on the bottle because you're not ready yet. Wow. That did me ready to listen, wouldn't it, you? He doesn't stop there. He keeps on going. In verse 3 he says, For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of this world? He says, you're all bickering and fighting. Let me tell you something. I, and you all heard me say this many times. I do not believe that church people ought to be bickering and fighting. I don't believe churches ought to be bickering and fighting because it is not of God and it's a bunch of babies. So, as we look at God's word, this isn't me, this is God saying it. Paul's telling the church, and, and it's very obvious. Quit being a bunch of babies and rely on Almighty God. We go to verse 4, it says, When one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I'm a follower of Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of this world? Hey, when you're picking people to follow, let me tell you something, you and I shouldn't be following people anyway. We need to be following Almighty God. Don't any of you ever say that I'm following Denver Copeland, but you shouldn't be following me. You should be following Jesus Christ. If you follow me, you're going to fall just like I would. You follow me, you're going to get disappointed. You follow Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. In verse 5 it says, after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. Did you see that four-letter word? Work. No. God's people are supposed to work. I'm not talking just in the secular world. God's word is very obvious that you got you work or you don't eat, but God's word is clear that you and I need to work for Him. So, 
We go on. I planted a seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. You see, we need to keep on planting, keep on watering, and let God take care of the results. There's a lot of people that you're going to plant all around, and nothing's going to happen. I want to tell you, in my life, there's one thing I had a hard time getting used to. It's that some people don't get it. They don't seem to grow. Guess what I found out? There's others that will grow and put your time into them. I'm not talking about leaving the other ones totally out. I'm not talking about when you put the majority of your time in the ones that are going to grow. Because you may never get the other ones to grow. Does that mean you stop trying to? No. It just means you don't spend all your time there. Verse 7 says... It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. It's all about God. It, I say this all the time. It's never been about you. It's never been about me. It's always been about Him. And it will always be about Him. Verse 8 says, The one who plants and the one who waters works together. You hear that? Amen. <laughs> This even happens in churches. I'm so glad to see the seven churches are meeting together Amen. on Sunday nights. I'm so glad to see that because you know something about us churches? We're afraid somebody's going to steal one of our members. Well, if they do, they weren't worth stealing anyway, so let them go. You know what I mean? Honestly. There are God's people in God's church, and then you serve where God is loving. And if God leads them somewhere else, Praise God. Amen. Man, we've had people leave churches before. They went to other churches, and I've known the pastors and talked to them. They said, man, you really sent us some workers. And I said, well, praise God, because they were duds in our church. I'm glad you got them to do something. And I'll tell you something. God's all about us doing what He requires, not what we think He needs. We need to do it because we serve Him and be obedient in Him. So it goes on to say not only we're here for the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. You see that? That four little words in there again. Work. Work. I'm telling you. I know some of you that breaks you out in the sweat and gives you the hives. Just to watch it. Well, I'm just not. Well, you don't understand, preacher. I just haven't been trained for that. Guess what? I haven't either. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. There's people that do it so much more eloquently. I'm lucky to pronounce that word. <laughs> oh, preacher, you don't know, but it's hard. No, I believe God knows that. But I believe God still expects you to do what He's called you to do, whatever that is in your life. We go on in verse 9 and it says, For we are both God's workers. And we are God's field. Amen. You are God's building. Amen. Amen. You hear that? Christ lives within all of us. That know him as Lord and Satan. And it says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. All right. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. Jesus Christ. All right, Jesus is our foundation. Praise God. He is the cornerstone. He is the one we're building upon. And the only thing that we can do is to build upon what He has already laid. And we do that by His Word. Folks, I want to tell you, you and I need to quit getting critical about other denominations. But we need to understand that they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're going to be in heaven for eternity with us. You see, it's time that we understand there's other people out there that are saved. I believe my poor old grandmother, when she got to heaven, had a heart attack when she found out Southern Baptists weren't the only ones there. Maybe you can tell you that one too. That's not a lie. That's a family thing. My mom was a sinner of God. She don't, I don't think she ever believed that our mom went to heaven. I'm going to tell you, I'm sure our mom went to heaven. It wasn't perfect that she saved. Knew Jesus Christ. 
I get tired of people saying, well, that's not right, this is not right. I learned for us to say, am I right with Almighty God? Because if you and I answer that question, then you and I will become who God created us to be in Him. Verse 12 says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, gold, uh, wood, hay, and straw. But, on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. I think we have a problem that we want to value ourselves a lot more than we do the things that are of God. And we want to value the things that we do instead of the things that God is doing through us. And if we do that with things that are not eternal, then they will never be eternal. And on Judgment Day, the stuff is going to be burnt away. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss and the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I don't know about you, but the old time preachers when I was a kid used to say, you don't want to make it just by the skin of your teeth. You don't want to make it just there, you need to think about it, very little skin on your teeth, all right? But said, so you don't want to make it, just make it. You want to get there, being able to glorify God, and God praising you for all that you've done for Him. I don't want to get up there and stand in line for nothing. I'd like to have double rewards. Everything I do is to get double rewards for God, although it really is. But that is that I'm going to do the things that God has called me to do and be faithful in doing them for Him until He comes again. All right. And that is not just polishing a pew. That is not just doing one or two things. That is living our lives for God in a way that other people don't live them. Yeah. That's not telling people how spiritual we are. That's them looking at us and saying, I can see God in you. Oh. See, it's about time to the church wake up and say, people ought to be able to look at us and see Almighty God in us and say, I don't know what that person has got, but I want it. It must be Jesus. Verse 16 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? I can say that right here to everyone in this building. Don't you realize today that we are all the temple of God. Yes. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of God lives in us. We talked last week about Moses and the Spirit of God. Gave just a little bit of that Spirit to seven of the others to change things. Folks, I'm going to tell you, when you and I will finally start allowing the Spirit of God to move in the way He wants to in our hearts and lives, we will see the hand of God work like never before. We go on to 17, it says, God will destroy anyone who destroys His temple. Who did you say was the temple? Us. For God's temple is holy. And you are that temple. Oh, I had someone just asked me the other day, you know, they told me I just read that God says we're supposed to be holy. I said, yeah. You know, the only way you can become holy, though, is to become more like Him. Oh, it's something that we can't even hardly think about getting to, but I want to tell you that's no reason not to try to get there. We need to learn more about Him and do more of His Word and His work that God may bless our lives in a mighty way. Because God's Word says that we've already read, read that He rewards us. And He will reward us. He can't lie. His Word does not lie. Verse 18 says, Stop deceiving yourselves. Well, I think we all do that. If you think you're wise by the world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. I like that phrase. That's something you ought to hang on the wall or something. That's something you ought to hang on the wall. Certain people come over and say, "Will you read this?" I mean, really? 
But God's word says, very simply, stop deceiving yourself. If you think you're a wise by the world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. My goodness, that seems awful abrasive. Only if you think you're pretty wise. <laughs> Verse 19 says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Just because you think like the rest of the world means that you don't think like God. It's foolishness to God. As the scripture says, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. I've heard all my life Christians talking about how good they were and how much they did for the Lord. If you've got to tell people what you did, you've got problems. You say, well, they're all messed up. They don't listen to God. That's not you, but for you to say that's the Holy Spirit's job. You see, what they should be able to say is, I know your heart, I know your life, because you haven't had to talk about it. I've seen it in you. He said he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. Hmm. Verse 20 says, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. That's God. 21 says, so don't boast about following a particular human leader for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life or and death or the present and the future, everything belongs to you. Now that's you and I. Everything belongs to us. Why? Because of Almighty God. Don't limit ourselves because of somebody else. Don't limit ourselves because of what someone else says. Don't limit ourselves because we have a God who is the creator of the world. We have a God that loved us enough to send his son to die for us. We have a God that's there for us in all things. Don't you think it's time we finally say, God, I want everything that you want for me. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Verse 23 says, And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Can I just simply say to that, if there's anything we ought to do, is understand we belong to Christ. To understand that belonging to Christ takes effort. That belonging to Christ takes work. That belonging to Christ takes servanthood. That belonging to Christ is something that you and I have to do because we want to and out of obedience serve Almighty God. I don't know about you, but I do want double miles. But get this, I want eternal miles. Not even miles that they say will never go away. I want eternal miles. I want God to be able to put his hand on my life and say, I'm going to use you because you're available. Not because you're anything, but because I can make you something. So let me ask you today, do you want God to make you something? He's the one who can do it. It's not you or I. It's him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about you. And God wants to bless us. The problem is he can't many times because our lives are such a wreck. And there may be some things going on in our lives right now. And I can tell you this. Satan's been after people in our church right now. Because God wants to do a work in us. God's starting to move in the hearts of people. Satan's starting to move all around people. Oh, he'll get pot stirred up. He'll get things going. He'll make people look at things when they ought to look at other things. If we don't watch ourselves, we'll get in a real mess here. Matter of fact, seven churches come together on Sunday nights. And if you haven't been to one of them, you need to go. Because I'm going to tell you, they've been good. They're a lot better than I thought they would have been. Because I believe God's showing up. And so I just thought I a bunch of Baptists going to show up. I got kind of cool. You haven't been to one of them, you need to come. God bless you for it. But today,
today the most important thing is we are the temple of God. How's that temple? Hmm. The full of the things of God are attracted by things of the world. Is it full of gold and silver? Or is it a bunch of hay and stuff? Why do we want to get rid of it now? So God can reward us and bless us. Today, maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask you if you would come and receive him today. I would ask that you would turn everything over to him. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins that you and I might be saved. Would you come and invite him into your heart today? Maybe you know him in your heart, but let's just be honest. You thought that's where it stopped. I want to tell you that's where it starts. Amen. We need to work for the Lord and serve him and do his will in our lives. We ought to be glorifying him in everything that we do. Oh, and it doesn't mean that we fail to minister to believe. It just means that we're not quite there yet. You know, just because I haven't made it to where I'm going in a vehicle when I'm on a trip, doesn't mean I'm going to stop because I didn't make it. It means I've got to keep on going to make it where I'm supposed to be. And so you and I got to keep on going so God can bless us. So that when we get to the end of this old life, the greatest God will get what he has for us. Glory. Because we live it for him. He was great this week for some of you that were Mrs. Brazier. Memorial service, celebration of life, when people testify that she witnessed to them. Amen. And family members testify that she witnessed to them. And other lives were saved because she witnessed to them. Didn't condemn them, but loved them and witnessed them. It's about time we wake up, old church. Do we really want what God wants? that we need to become who God created us to be. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I'm going to ask us all to stand. I'm going to ask you to step out and come. God's not finished with you. God will take care of whatever's wrong. You all stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I pray today that you would help us. Father, we be obedient to you and to your word. Father, help us because None of us have arrived yet. None of us are where we're supposed to be. We're all working to go forward in you. But Father, I pray today that you would not let that stop us, not let Satan stop us, because things aren't the way we think they ought to be. But Father, we would give you all the glory and praise and say, Father, I need more of you. I keep getting in the way, and I need you. Father, maybe somebody here that's lost and doesn't know you and never received you as Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day that they would come and receive you. Maybe there's something you need to make this church their church home. Whatever it is, O oh Lord, bless this time today as we give it to you. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.